everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the next session at DJLF's uh, Samvad on this, sadly, the last day of this wonderful festival. Uh, I've been looking forward to what promises to be a fascinating conversation. Genes are blueprint, not our destiny. Sharad Paul was named Renaissance Man by the New Zealand Herald, with, and with good reason. He is a skin cancer specialist, family physician, author, poet, academic, evolutionary biologist, storyteller, social entrepreneur, and an adjunct, adjunct professor at Auckland University of Technology, who has won several awards and was a finalist for New Zealander of the Year. His latest book is The Genetics of Health. Dr. Paul will be in conversation with a man who really needs no introduction, particularly at ZJLF, Sonjay Roy, Managing Director of Teamwork Arts. Thank you. Welcome them to stay, please. Good afternoon, and hopefully you've all had a fabulous festival. I don't know about you, but I've got a surfeit of things going through my head with every session that one has attended. So thank you all for coming here, and do remember next year's dates are 23rd to 27th of January. Our London dates, I think, are 12th to 14th of June. Uh, 21st and 22nd is Ireland. America, for those of you who prefer to come to Boulder, Colorado, or New York or Florida, is in September. And Adelaide is in November. I think it's the third week, but it'll be all up on the website. So you have many places to choose to come to if uh, you're missing us in between, which I hope you are. A couple of weeks ago, uh, was it a couple of weeks ago? Last, well, late last year. Um, Sharad, who I've known for a couple of years, and apart from being an incredible uh, doctor and an oncologist and a skin specialist, he's also a great master storyteller, which is how I encountered him in Goa at a festival called the Thing Festival, where he completely set the stage on fire, and he had over a thousand people in that particular audience sort of literally hanging on to every word that he said, and then demanded to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with him post that, which went on for a couple of hours. So I think you'll be fascinated with what he says. Uh, some time ago, he said to me, why don't you get your gene uh, stroke DNA test done? And I was like, oh, okay, sure, let's do it. And then as it happened, the kit that he sent me arrived somewhere else, and then we kept missing each other. And finally, it arrived in America. He had to fly back home. I didn't get it. I came back to India. And somehow, the kit finally came, and my gene test arrived uh, two weeks ago, I think, just during New Year's or over New Year's. I wasn't, and I wasn't going to mention it in the interest of And it was fabulous Saturday. because I've been dining out on the story because one of the things that he says, which, which is the reason why I've been dining out, it says, I have a great uh, uh, affinity to do weightlifting stuff. So I'm like, that's my interpretation. Exactly so fantastic. Right. And all the other stuff that it said was, you know, wheat allergy and milk allergy and you'll drop dead tomorrow and day after and all of that. We all know that. We know we're going to die. But amazing. Thank you, Sharad, for coming here to the Jaipur Literature Festival. You've been a regular literally across the world, uh, a great, great uh, JLF junkie. Uh, over to you, and hopefully at the end, the way we're going to do it at the end, I'm going to ask a few more questions of him, and then we'll open it up to the audience. But over to Sharad. Thank you, Sanjay. I wasn't actually going to mentioned Sanjoy's test, like I said, on the interests of patient confidentiality. But I actually, like an open book. that's right. But that's not what the results said, by the way. <laughs> it, it basically, the two types of genes, some people more have more power genes and endurance genes. So we can actually use these to pick athletic preferences, the type of exercise which is more beneficial to you. And what I was really saying was that he's a hopeless runner. <laughs> you can't, can't hear? So maybe I'll use the microphone. Can we get, get a cordless? Maybe that's easier. Yeah, so basically I was just saying that Sanjoy is uh, not a very good endurance runner and perhaps he should take up some weight training. <laughs> anyway, the, the, so, so, the real <laughs> so the real reason I say genes are a blueprint, not a destiny, is as you'll see that what we do day to day also 
expresses new proteins. So fundamentally, um, like you know, Richard Dawkins spoke of the selfish genes, genes just make proteins. They don't really care if you're happy, you're sad, or if you're well, or they, by the by, happen to be in your body and they're producing protein. So if you eat junk, you become junk, right? So it's literally uh, the genes just produce proteins based on your actions. However, from an evolutionary biology point of view, um, massive changes in genes take a long period of time. And we all came out of Africa 200,000 years ago, migrated out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. So as we went around the world, what we ate and what we did transformed some of our genes. So some of us have different preferences, and those are the things I'm going to talk about. It does not click? It is not clicking. Point it again. Oh, yeah, now it is. So basically, uh, genes, I, how did I get into genomics in the first place is really through my work on skin. So when we're dealing with advanced tumors of skin, and the first thing we do is test people's genes to see if they're going to respond to a particular medication if something like that is needed. And I was really asking myself a broader question. Why don't we do this for day-to-day -day things? You know, what about coffee? What about, you know, um, things we eat? Um, do different people have different preferences? And it also came about from my skin research, which was really because you cannot have bad health and good skin. Because skin is a real true mirror. It really reflects what's going on underneath. Your metabolism, things like that. So really, this is a literal true mirror. So um, I was in New York and walked past the store which had a true mirror. And it's basically two 90-degree angled mirrors and a third image, which is really what people see off you. But we did a survey, and 70% of the people who saw their image in a true mirror, which is what the public sees of you or your friends, felt that their image was altered. They said, I don't tilt that way, so because we don't actually see a true image of ourselves. And that's what genomics is like. Where am I supposed to point this? Okay, it says it just has a big delay, all right. So, for example, we know that wrinkling, for example, when I was studying the formation of wrinkles, we know that premature aging or developing wrinkles, going bald or in certain parts, uh, creases in certain parts of your face can indicate different things. So, for example, a big study was done in Denmark with 10,000 people. They looked at um, earlobe creases or wrinkles in front of your ears, and what they found was that they directly indicated an increased risk of heart disease. So what I actually do is we can actually scan people's faces, and we can actually tell what their propensity to get something is. So in some ways, what we find metabolically, the same genes which are implicated in aging, chronic injury, chronic illness, cancer, stress, are all interrelated. So in other words, if you're in an abusive relationship, you will age. If you've got cancer, you will age. If you're carrying a chronic injury which hasn't been treated, you will age. So these are, of course, things like sun damage. It does cause a stress on the skin, also ages you. But so basically, that's why through skin, I started studying the genomics for wellness. So really, this isn't a talk about illness, but it's really about wellness. So the skin is the only universal organ, um, and it's because really we have other organs uh, and touch, you know, the skin is the sense organ of touch. So you can live without eyesight, you can live without hearing, smell, uh, but you can't live without touch. So it's our only essential organ. Now see, the brain is just a computer, and the brain evolved for movement. So the more we move, um, the bigger our brain. So if we looked at how um, human beings evolved out of Africa. When people started walking, I mean, we developed larger brains. So I've been lucky in life to actually um, have to work with animals as well. So I've had quite a lot of work with primates. And what you find is that m as people started walking, so this process took 28 million years in Africa, and we lost our fur because our brain needed to cool down because the brain is just a computer. And as you know, if you go to computer companies, they have big cooling systems to cool down. But we retained our hair. And I looked at this puzzle as to why did we lose our fur but have our hair. And hair is really an insect sensing mechanism. So if you shave a square of hair, your insect bite ratio there is about 2.7 times that of 
if you uh, so so hair really senses insects and things like that. So the importance is in moving for your brain's sake. So the classic parable here is the story of a sea squirt. I mean, it's a creature which has two life forms. On one form, it's got these wonderful tentacles and it's walking around. And in the next life form, it really gets attached to, I mean, it's a starfish next to it, not a sea squirt, but then it ends up becoming like that. So it really falls in love, and it falls in love with a rock. And once it falls in love with its rock, it never moves, and at this point, it decides to digest its brain. See, there is a moral to the story here. So if you fall in love with your rock, and you're just going to sit in front of TV and eat a packet of chips, you may as well eat your brain. <laughs> so I was actually asking, can laziness be inherited, right? And so we know that as we walk more, there is um, the BDNF, the bone-derived neurotropic factor, which is expressed. So in actual fact, um, there is a gene for laziness. It's just that there is hope for us because the more we move, we start expressing more positive genes. When we've done mice studies where mice specifically had these sluggish genes, putting them on endurance exercise then started expressing more vigorous <laughs> genes. So in effect, you know, there's hope for all of us. So basically, in New Zealand, there was an article written in the newspaper which said that I was the busiest man in the country. And so I thought that I should test myself if I had lazy genes. By the way, I think you had them, didn't you? No, just kidding. <laughs> I'd love to have a lazy gene. So I just am going to put up my test. But this responds very <laughs> slowly. So, so anyway, so I actually didn't, uh, I wanted to see, do I have any specific genes which make me more active? And actually not. So I'm just normal. So what it was just really uh, nature, uh, it was nurture over nature. I think if you, if you point it to them, they'll change it from there, right? Okay, so, just so just then, I just say the next slide then. Can I have the next slide, the next please? Slide. Yeah, so basically, you know, we can use this in real terms as to optimizing a performance. So, for example, we know that exercise improves learning, but what forms of exercise improve what forms of learning? So, if you, the timing of exercise is critical. So, if you want knowledge acquisition and you want to just learn something, so you're at a test you want to study for, then a short, intense burst of exercise is better, like a sprint. But if you want to then retain it, so if this was an exam which was something you just wanted to get through and never wanted to remember that again, then don't do a long uh, run afterwards. But if you wanted to acquire it, you can. So we actually use this in sports. I often uh, consult into some sports things. So we can actually tailor this to both sports and executive performance. Can I have the next slide, please? So procrastination is slightly different. This was an article in America because when I spoke there, they found it very funny. But actually, procrastination is a very finely tuned evolutionary adaptation. So if you think about it, 100,000 years ago, life was so dangerous that people who came, uh, 1 in 10 or 1 in 20 were killed by, you know, saber to tigers and things like that. So I looked up, because Shakespeare's books are full of, you know, gore and bloodshed. At Shakespeare's time, the murder rate in Oxford was 1 in 350, and in London was something like 1 in 500. And today, I think it's, I don't know, five or a million or something, and we still think we live in the unsafest of times. It's, so, so we live in the safest of times, but both stress and procrastination genes evolved out of that. Because you see, the scaredy cats survived because we didn't go and fight the battle. <laughs> we were still in the cave saying, you guys go and take on the tiger, I'll stay here, and guess who survived? So by sheer numbers, more of the scaredy cats survived, and that's why we carry anxiety genes. But what we now know is procrastination is slightly different. It's very finely tuned adaptation where procrastination is generally high achievers, and it's to do with the connectivity between different parts of your brain neurons, what we call resting state functional connectivity. And people who have a, you know, higher connectivity, we can actually predict who are procrastinators. Next slide, please. So really, when we do progress lines of 40 students and you look at the course, actually the procrastinators in the end perform better than the guys who rush out and do half-cooked jobs. So, you know, if you are 
procrastinating, it's really because in your heart of hearts, you actually believe that the plan or business or whatever is not quite ready. Next slide, please. Yeah, so Thomas Edison um, was a classic example. He always wrote about how he procrastinated, and he often said, you know, it's not that he invented one new thing, but he, with that he invented, I think he said, 900, uh, several thousand things that didn't work. So really, what type of movement? See, the brain, like I said, evolved for movement. So what are the three types of movement? Locomotion, walking, grasping, which is a primitive reflex, and balance, which is orienting. So any form of exercise which has all these three is the best form of exercise for the brain. Next slide, please. So really, funnily enough, when I started writing the genetics of health, I actually thought I'd be writing about yoga and tai chi and things because they were more in vogue and it was getting more trendy. So yoga is actually good for stress relaxation, lowers your blood pressure a bit. But actually for Parkinson's and dementia, they did a direct studies between tango and yoga and tai chi and tango was the best form of exercise. So when my book was launched in New York, um, I actually, um, the guy you saw dancing there was a guy who taught Al Pacino to dance in a scent of a woman. And when he heard this, he came charging out from the audience, so we had a uh, tango lesson. Um, next slide, please. Next, I think I'll cover this. Yeah, so, so really, stress is another issue I said earlier. Not only does it age you, but stress, in short bursts, stress is like a drug. Because you know sh the three forms, first you secrete adrenaline, then you have noradrenaline, then cortisol, which is a steroid. So if you are in a short-term stress, it's like a drug. It gives you a boost. But if you're under chronic stress, then the cortisol takes over and it suppresses your immune system. So this can have effects including on muscles and various things. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes, you can see there's been well-known, you know, the broken heart syndrome, intense stress. You know, the heart can change shape. What the Japanese say it becomes like an octopus trap. Next slide, please. So this is one thing I want to point out is so these... The part of the brain which actually produces the stress chemical noradrenaline, which is the one which is immediately after the early phase, is the locus cerulis. And that's literally now what is implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So what happens is as they are in the Alzheimer's disease, as you start losing matter from the outside of the brain inwards, next slide please, what we find now is in, even though we know the type of plaques which form Alzheimer's, what they find now is what they think the ground zero of is now for Alzheimer's is this intense stress area. So we're talking about the fat genes and skinny brains and fat guts. Now see, this is an interesting thing. The fatter your gut, the skinnier your brain becomes. I kid you not. So what the studies show that for every two inches of waist circumference you gain, you lose six to 12 percent of your cognitive ability. Um, the next slide, please. So you know, dolphins are an exception, but you look most of the creatures and the humans have one of the largest brain sizes for, uh, you know, body weights. Next slide, please. Yep, so, so one study I was really interested in, there was a study done from 1895 to 1970 in Sweden. It really interested me because they took three generations of people and they looked at the diets of the grandparents and they tracked it all the way down to their grandchildren. And what they found is that if your grandfather was calorie restricted or was in a time of famine, then your grandchildren had a lower risk of heart disease and diabetes. But if your grandfather picked himself and he was really obese and Indulge. overweight and indulged too much, it had affected your grandchildren. So really, the message to reduce your eating is not just for your health, but for your future generations. But the second thing was I found interesting is the impact on mood. So they put mice on an American cafeteria diet, which is just, you know, uh, it was just fast food and fries. Burgers and french fries. Yeah, and, what they, and Coke, right. And what they found is within a few days, the mice started expressing the genes. Of course, they became overweight, of course. But what's more interesting is they got paranoid and they didn't like mice which looked different. <laughs> right. So, so I've said that in the U.S., you know, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of political things and everything else, but, you know, America's really the junk food capital. You know, you travel to America in the middle, outside the east and west coast, you struggle to eat anywhere except in a fast food place. Next slide, please. So I was speaking in Chatham House in the U.K. about genes, gems, and geography because of the sugar tax which Britain was introducing. And 
really, there's a big loophole there because at the highest level, if you add a drop of milk, then you're exempt because milk is considered healthy. So while the tax went up to you know 12 grams and stuff, the sweetest drinks I found in the UK had 17 grams per milk, and they were all like milkshakes and things like that. So if you want to bypass the tax, all you put is add a drop of milk to your Coke, and then you can say it's a healthy drink. So only humans and hummingbirds can taste sweet. Other animals can't really taste sweet. But the hummingbirds um, have an extra taste receptor, which we converted it to taste umami. You know the umami taste for mushrooms and soy. And, um, the, so we, we don't. So, but the interesting thing is, therefore, we don't, when tests were done on hummingbirds giving them artificial sweeteners, they spit them out straight away, recognizing that it's a poison. But we don't do that. So if we don't do that, that means our bodies don't do that. So what's interesting is even artificial sweeteners now have been implicated in causing diabetes simply because the pancreatic response is the same simply because our brains can't tell the difference. Now this is something I was looking at addiction and there is a difference between sugar addiction and say something like coffee. Coffee binds to adenosine, so if you really wanted to go cold turkey, you can go in 12 days. But sugar binds very heavily to your dopamine receptors, just like drugs like cocaine, like I put a slide earlier. So really what happens is you really end up addicted to it, so it's going to be very difficult for you to get off sugar. And, and that's why you see the consequences. Next. So I started looking at more and more day-to-day -day stuff. Um, and I thought, you know, a couple of for about a decade ago, one day a week I teach creative writing to children. So we just, I teach them to write stories and it sort of helps their math and science and for, because of that I ended up as an advisor on UNESCO. But what we've done from this year is we started including nutritional programs. We teach the parents and the children in lower Odessa, like poorer schools, to eat healthy. So I used to have a bookstore cafe which used to fund these programs. Next slide, please. And so I suddenly got addicted a little bit to coffee, and then I found this in the British Library in London. There was a petition women wrote against men drinking coffee in 1674, and they said that this heathenish liqueur had eunuched our men, and they felt that all these British men had become impotent because they'd started drinking coffee, and they actually appealed to Parliament to stop them drinking it. But of course, the men didn't want to give up the coffee, and they had a counter-argument saying, no, how great it was. So the question is, is coffee good for you or is it bad for you? The answer is it depends on your genes. So 50% of the population are fast metabolizers and ballpark 50% are slow. If you're a slow metabolizer and you drink more than 200 milligrams a day, as to give you an example, uh, espresso single shot is 80 milligrams, Turkish coffee is 150, then you actually increase your risk of ha um, heart and kidney disease. Can I have the next slide, please? This was a study done both in Asians and European populations, and it looked at coffee intake and risk of hypertension and coffee intake and myocardial infarction, which is just a medical way of saying heart attack. I mean, the only saving grace here is most of these heart attacks were non-fatal, but they're still pretty inconvenient, right? Um, so that's the sort of gene testing program I put San uh, Sanjoy through. The next slide, please. So I tested my own coffee genes, and actually, if I drink coffee after midday, I actually get palpitations. So I thought I'd have the dodgy coffee genes, but actually I don't. So it's actually not as intuitive as you think. We're not as smart as we think we are. Um, so this was just a thing of the blue zones of the world where people live longer, healthier, and happier. And there's a story in the book I write about a Greek veteran called Stomitis Moriatis, who was a fought for America, and then he went back after the World War, and then he you know, bought a Chevy, a condo, living the American dream, and he was diagnosed with lung cancer, and he went to see the doctors, and they said, listen, this is very aggressive. You've got seven months to live, so really do what you want to do. There's nothing we can offer you. So he decided, well, I'll go back to Greece in Icaria because he had never seen his homeland, and he went back there, and he found younger and older generation interacted a lot. They all met in the streets. They danced. Um, they ate pretty healthy, it was mostly seafood, they didn't get much red meat, lots of vegetables. And eventually, 25 years later, he thought he'll go back to America and report his case to the doctors. The only reason he couldn't do so was because all the doctors had died by the time he went back. <laughs> um, so there is a message in these places is they only eat till they're 80% full, you don't eat till you're full in the stomach. So there's rules which are in the book and I won't go into it because Sanjay wanted to ask me a lot of questions about skin, and I just realized they put the 
other presentation, not the one I gave them yesterday. So is there a gene for faith? So this was an interesting question I asked myself when looking for the placebo gene. If you go to the next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so what happened is, uh, you know, many years ago there was a big uh, study, uh, a paper in The Lancet which said, you know, the end of homeopathy um, because, you know, it has no scientific basis. So what I was looking at was that do things which don't have any scientific basis work for some people better than others? So Ted Kapchek at Harvard did a study where 210 people seven, with intractable migraines. So they put 70% on a migraine pill, 70%, I mean, 70 people on acupuncture and 70 people on nothing. As expected, in those taking the drug, you know, 70% got better, acupuncture was about 50, placebo virtually nobody, probably three. What was interesting is it was actually a nocebo trial. The guys who were taking nothing were actually taking the pill. So people then looked at what was common to the people who got better on nothing and who didn't get better on something, and they had the same gene. That's a dopaminergic allele of the comp uh, catecholamine or methyl transferase gene. So there is actually what we can now call a placebo or a placebo gene. So in my view, we should use it because we know that placebos cannot shrink tumors, I must say, and placebos cannot, you know, they can't cut out tumors, they can't cure cancer, but they can work for pain and stress and anxiety and all these medications have such high amount of side effects. In my view, if you know genetically who will benefit from a placebo, I personally think there's no harm in giving them one for those kind of things rather than giving them something toxic. So lastly, I want to close with a paradox of generosity. You know, study was done, is there a gene for generosity? Yes, some people actually do an AVPI1 gene, which is, makes you a little bit more generous. But actually, like I said, if you start giving, you start expressing more genes as well. But what was interesting is a study done at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, large study, where they put people on internet games where you chose to give your money away, share it, grab everybody else's money, over time, they found that the ungenerous generally had 50% worse health. So if there is a reason to be more giving, it may be a selfish one. It's actually better for your own health. So on that note, I'll actually close and just take questions from Sanjoy and then from the audience. Thank you. Sharad Paul, incredible. <laughs> and just about the generosity, Gene, just remember we all have charity, so it's good for your health. Sure, th this was of course fascinating and, and your work earlier on skin has been equally fascinating. But before I come to that, I'm gonna go back to what you started with about that all of us have our ancestors in Africa. And I know that while this has been scientifically stated, it's still a big question mark, especially in many of the Western countries where race still t tends to be a primary motive. Can you just talk to us about is this scientifically the fact right now, or is this still yeah. a question mark? No, no, I think there is no doubt. I think the question mark was really over whether, homeo, uh, whether our, our race, the Homo sapiens, were the only ones, or whether there were Neanderthals living in Europe around about the same time, which there were, and there was some interbreeding, but overall, um, that was very small. But we know that we, Homo sapiens, all came out of Africa. Now, the question, what we must say is the entire gamut of skin color as we've discussed really comes from migration and diet. So when people, so like I said earlier, we lost fur because we started walking more. And we needed to cool our bodies down. If you expose folic acid to sunlight in your lab, it gets lysed by photolysis. So the skin darkened in Africa to preserve folic acid. So actually I, in another talk, um, when I was talking on skin, we put a map of folic acid levels around the world and map of populations. And you can actually see that's why darker continents like Africa, Indian subcontinent, have larger populations because you have less birth defects, because you have more folic acid if your skin is darker. So actually, even in countries like New Zealand, which are multicultural, the Maori population grows faster than the European. And people often say they're just breeders and that people who are racist take it that way, but that fact is just pure biology. See, biology has no bias, bigotry does. So when you go into Europe, the skin lightened for the other reason is to lighten your skin because you needed more vitamin D. So people who could not absorb vitamin D, they developed rickets. On one hand, rickets makes you infertile, so you got bred out. But the, those who weren't bred out got bent and stooped over the rickets, so you can see how the feelings of racial superiority came about. But if you take exceptions like the polar bears and Eskimos, or the Inuit, they actually have dark skin. So if you actually shave the polar bear's fur, the yeah. skin is black.
That's because polar bears and the Inuit, their diet was so rich in salmon and cod. They were already eating so much vitamin D. They were the only people who didn't need to lighten their skin. I mean, actually, to prove this point a few years ago, half in jest, but actually I said before a Miss World competition, I said that Miss Norway would have a better tan than Miss Estonia. But the reason for that is Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, the Baltic states, were warmer currents. So when people migrated out of Africa, they farmed grain. So because of that, if you're eating grain over time, then your skin lightens. So actually, recently, I was in the UK last year in England, and of course, there was a story about Cheddar Man they found in Cheddar Gorge in Somerset and the ancient Britain. And I was more interested when the scientists first found out what did Cheddar Man eat. See, like I said, you become what you eat. So we can analyze fossils and find out what they ate. And they found he was a great muesli maker. So if Cheddar Man was just eating muesli, then what I predicted is over time, he would have been black to start off with and his skin would have lightened. But because of the fact that Cheddar Man existed about 9,000 years ago, we know that blue eyes was a mutation about 10,000 years ago. Before that, there was nobody with blue eyes. It was an Okawan mutation. So we knew that then Cheddar Man would have blue eyes and dark skin, which is exactly how it turned out to be. To use it in India, um, the upper class, the Brahmins, were all vegetarians except in Bengal. So uh, you can't eat yourself to whiteness in one generation, but it takes about 400 to 500 years. And if you're eating just vegetarian food and no fish and everything else, your skin starts lightening. And so there's a subtle difference in shade and people perceive that lightness to be. So you can actually explain a lot of things like athletic ability, why we are so terrible at track and field. And, uh, you know, and, and things like that we can... Pre and wh if African skin is as dark as our skin, why are there better athletes? Because it happened over 28 million years, they have very high pre-vitamin D levels. So their vitamin D is actually twice that of Europeans, and Europeans have twice as much as the Indian subcontinent. Wow. You know, you were talking about, you were talking about hair, and uh, the, the loss of hair indicates something in skin. Is that also sort of genetic? I mean, my, our eldest son has, uh, ha has been losing his hair for a while. I'm not looking hand, in any And I have a lot of direction. hair, so. <laughs> I was taking very clear not, that I was not looking in any particular direction. Sanjoy, you're going to get me in trouble. No, all I was saying is, yes, male pattern baldness is genetic. Like, if your father is bald, you may go bald. But what I mean is, within that, if somebody is aging prematurely, so what I mean is, if you are aging faster than other people within your family at that age, um, or if you're suddenly getting more wrinkles or something else, something is going on. See, often we can see people and we can straight away ask them, is something else going on? I, I was giving this lecture in the US and an American um, military dermatologist said to me, he said, you're so right, and he hadn't thought of it, but he said when he was posted in Iraq, he said every time, you know, he said you wouldn't believe the number of marriage breakups there were when soldiers were at war, and he was saying when they were under stress, he could straight away, he would say, he would see some breakouts on the skin, nothing, and he'd say, are you guys all right? So really, skin is really a reflector of what's going on underneath. You know, the other thing you talked about, uh, uh, Cheddar Man eating muesli and, of course, the whole thing of wheat, etc. Why is it that today, across the world, uh, the allergy to wheat has increased uh, so many fold? And what does that say about both the wheat that's been grown and, of course, our genes? I think, actually, first thing I must say is it's not new. The first writings of uh, celiac and wheat was actually, um, it comes from quelios in Greek, which means abdominal. And actually, Aratius in Greece, I think 2000 or 3000 BC, wrote a detailed thing about wheat allergy to the degree incredible. I mean, he, with no technology, actually wrote there's two types of this. Some people have it mild, in which case it's just like indigestion. Some people have a severe form, which means it affects their immune system, which we know is totally true. So to give you an example, the, um, now in India, it's really to do with what your predominant diet was over time. So. In the south of India, for example, um, where it was predominantly rice eating, um, gluten intolerance is very rare. In the north of India, where a lot more wheat is eaten, over time that intolerance is higher. Um, in the US, it's about 1 in 133 people. So I don't know whether, I think there's more an awareness of it now. I, I'm not convinced that there's really an increase in it. Um, the second thing, things like lactose, for example, is really more predictable because humans could not digest lactose till recently. So about dairy farming came out of the Middle East and then went into Europe about, you know, um, between 15,000 to 7,000 years ago. And during that time, before that, there was just a famine and those people desperate turned to milk. And actually people who 
could not digest it actually died. So actually, it was actually the tolerance which was then the gene which got ex expressed. So certain people who came from more hunter-gatherer stock, like Asians, actually dairy didn't come out of Asia, it came out of the Middle East. So in Middle East and Europe, um, lactose intolerance is much rarer, whereas 50% of Asians, adults, are generally lactose intolerant, like I am, and it's just I've tested many people in Indonesia here, that you see very prevalent compared to where. So what your ancestors did, because genes change slowly, uh, actually makes a difference to these kind of genes. But for subtle expressions like what we were talking about, day-to-day -day stuff, you can, it's not your destiny, you can, yeah. Uh, but like, for example, in my report you said, you know, because I have a high, this thing of wheat intolerance and yeah. above average of uh, lactose intolerance, you said, have multi-greens. Is that, does that sort of help the system? I mean, what? Yeah, so what it means is that if you were intolerant, say, let's just say you were at a higher end, so, see, the one thing I must say is gene testing tests your propensity. It's not testing for the disease because I don't test for illness um, because I, there are a lot of imp uh, insurance implications. In America, there's a lot of sale of your data when I was there, so I don't do it. So, but what it once you have a propensity, normally you need another trigger, and that trigger can be an illness or something else, which then leads you to get a more severe form. If you didn't have a propensity and then you had a trigger, then you're less likely to get it. So, so the point is, um, with gene testing, if we say you had a, say, medium risk, what it meant is if you overindulged in challenging your system all the time, then you can suppress your immune system because your body's stress levels go up because you're always fighting um, something. It's like nowadays, you see in the old days when peanut allergies, they used to think that, you know, it can be fatal to some children, but now the new school of thought is to gradually introduce in low doses because your body then gets used to it. That's one school of thought as opposed to uh, but if you challenge them straight away, then of course it can be, uh, have serious consequences. You know, this famous story of Angelina Jolie having done her gene test, which gave her a propensity to perhaps uh, get a cancer of the breast, and then she decided to have an operation. What is the, I mean, looking forward into the looking glass, how will the fight for cancer uh, be taken to the next stage, looking at the whole issue of gene and DNA testing? I must say that the example you've given because it got worldwide publicity for gene testing. But I must point out that the BRCA1 gene, which people test for, for breast cancer, only about 5% of women who get breast cancer have that gene. So, so you must say, yes, those people... Only 5%? Yeah, or maybe a max of 10 in certain populations. But what I mean is the majority of people who get breast cancer don't have that gene. It is true that if you have the gene, you have a very high likelihood of getting it. And so but only 5%? of the total population, that's what I'm saying. So what I'm trying to get at is, if you take all the women who have breast cancer, majority of them won't have that genetic reason, right? Because everything in life is nature and nurture. So there's genes and there's environment, right? So it's like for skin cancer, the environment is sunlight. For lung cancer, it's largely smoking and for many other cancers. So all you can do is control those sort of things. So yes, but, but what I mean is uh, where we're going with um, is more using understanding genomics to help people respond to medications better. So rather than going away from, so we're going away more from the chemotherapy type of thing to more immune therapy, where you keep the cancer under control like you do with HIV for a long period of time. And I think that's how we're really going, not so much using this like the example you give, that's a bit drastic. Because somebody else may have been given the same thing, but if they thought, oh, well, but of everybody who has breast cancer, only few people get it, yes, my risk may be 50 to 70. I'll just keep my breasts and have regular checks. So, so the, you know, there are also different ways. You touched upon this, but this year at the Culture Minister's Summit in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, there was a whole host of research that we, because we were very keen to see how science and the arts, you know, works together and how the arts can help in medical practice in a, in a lot of ways. And you talked about tango, and this particular professor did a fabulous paper showing how tango was able to retard, perhaps, or help, certainly, uh, the advent of, uh, of Alzheimer's. If you can just... I think, like I said, fundamentally the brain evolved for movement. So we all move. So the message for life would be eat um, less, move more, and live positively. But uh, if you are, uh, um, movement needs to incorporate all these three forms. So if you 
And the reason a waltz, for example, is not as good as the tango is because the movements are predetermined. You're going one, two, three, one, two, three. Whereas in a tango, you're just going with the flow, right? So actually, I was in Dublin, and I was um, asked to speak, and I titled my lecture, Why We Can Finally Forgive the Irish for River Dance. You know, the dreadful dance, no, just kidding. If there are any Irish here. But the real reason is because you're moving your legs, you're holding on to somebody, so you're grasping, and you're also balancing. So actually, even Celtic dancing reduces your risk of dementia. So, so if you want to take up more things which were not natural to humans, but which do the thing, they're things like cycling. So, but that's not a natural form of movement. So the more natural form of movement is any movement that incorporates those three. So the reason like yoga does stress, re re and same with Tai Chi is good for balance. So the specific exercises which are specifically good to express certain genes, but they don't do the whole gamut because the leg movement is a big part of it. So we put people in functional MRIs and people moving their legs. You can see the expression in various uh, parts of the brain. Wow. And Bollywood dancing, is that a, as good well, as As long as you're holding on to somebody, perhaps a tree. Uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> you could on be that holding happy on note, something. let's quickly ask a couple of questions. Maybe we'll do them in clusters so we'll get more. I'll start from, I'll start from this side and then come to you at the end. So these two and one mic in the front here. I'll come to you. Fascinating, Sharad. Thank you. you. You have got us totally confused. Uh, Indians have pot bellies. I don't think it's a general they, rule it and, is, right? And, and they are supposed to be more intelligent ah, than others. <laughs> and particularly Gujaratis may be sharper in business and others. How much, how much does gene really influence our life? Now, let me finish this question. We inherit some traits from our ancestors. We inherit some traits from our ancestors and we still become different from our ancestors. Now, where is the gene finish, and where does the rest of the thing come? I think so, so, so just hold that, and yeah. let's get one more question, and then we'll come back. Okay, please allow me a little longer. No, no question. Don't give a comment, only a question. Because <laughs> we need him to answer. So if it's, a, if it's a statement, later. No, no, it is a question. Question, short question. Okay. Start. Oh, okay, I am 75 years old. Unless I die by the, of the accident, how am I supposed to live? And I will give some three, four things. Uh, I did PhD at the age of uh, five years ago. Uh, and my forefather was a Nagar Seth of Amir who funded Jai Second in 1727 yeah. to establish Jaipur city. And I am a disaster management partner of the Jaipur Literature Festival, social work. And I visited uh, Sandania, uh, two of the blue zones, Loma Prita and Sardania Island and Greece to uh, learn more about longevity. You talked about blue zones. I think that's enough. So, so I guess long, how long will he, does he still have to live? And <laughs> the pot, the pot belly, stroke, skinny jeans. Yeah, I, I guess. Um, you got to take it at an individual level. So what it means is, if you took it yourself, right, then if you, for every inch you lose off your waist, your brain gets better. Right, so, so it's not, so when you're talking about a population, so um, Indian population is actually fairly unhealthy, right, and it's, um, it's largely because of the fact that the vitamin D is a big thing because one of the things is vitamin D is a calcium regulator. So if you have low vitamin D and you consume a lot of calcium, that calcium becomes intracellular, so increased risk of heart disease and diabetes. And that's actually one of the reasons, not the only reason, why we have a massive epidemic in India, plus our fondness for sweets. So, so I guess the thing I'm going to say is there's always nature and nurture. So with your actions, you express genes. And that's why the talk was titled, it's your blueprint, not your destiny. So you get your blueprint from your grandparents, but you can change it. So a child... So, for example, somebody asked me yesterday a question. In, in America, when studies were done, African-American populations, if you took those children at a very early age and exposed them to the same kind of education, same kind of everything else, they shine just as much as anyone else. So Malcolm Gladwell writes about his talent born or made. You know, you can make talent. So in actual fact, it really takes hard work, passion, uh, spending enough time doing it, and the opportunities. And to answer... Your question, I think. Uh, 
So because you're you know, moving your legs and you're doing all this and you're still studying and all that, so the message, there was an article of Astra in US on what can people do as they get older. So the most important things are uh, moving more, exercising leg movement, learning something new, especially languages. So all that kind of stuff. And sounds like you know, you're doing all the right things. So, he you know, he danced the in the after party at 2 o'clock yeah. in the morning yesterday. Let's go into the... He's, well, not, he's not a magician. I think he's only a doctor. That's right. Let's start from here and we'll come to the back. I d I'm not going to ask you how long can I, uh, I'm going to live, but I would like to ask you, since you touched uh, upon the Mediterranean diet, yes. uh, as a study which was done to show the effect on prevention of heart disease. Now, could you please tell me how many glasses of red wine can I consume every day? Every day? <laughs> Thank you. The, I, I think the truth of the matter is there's a myth about red wine being really good for you, because once you, uh, you know, Anything in moderation is not necessarily harmful, but the point is there's no real hard evidence. So if you want then to get the same benefit, just eat dark grapes. We know that the darker the food, um, the more polyphenols, the more things beneficial for you. So the most beneficial form of those grapes is the dark grapes from which you're getting the red wine. The fact that alcohol, there's nothing good about alcohol, really, because of the fact that it dehydrates you, it affects a lot of genes adversely, it increases the risk of breast cancer, for example, various other things. So, so the thing is, that's really a medical myth. I don't think any doctor would seriously recommend increasing your intake of red wine for health. Um, so sorry to disappoint you on that. But, but on the Mediterranean diet, the simple summary is don't eat until you're full eat plenty of raw salads. We don't overcook them like we do in India. Um, plenty of different colors at the same time and plenty of seafood there because they get the vitamin D from it. At the back, I'll come to the middle in a second. Thank you. Um, what influence You'll need do, to... What, what influence do genetics have on the immune system? Yes, um, I think I've sort of alluded to it in the sense that everything uh, is, like is, again, nature and nurture, but this certainly does. But um, so to give you an example, one of the key things in the book I mentioned, the Genetics of Health book, by the way, is really how our diets have changed over from ancient man. But we haven't changed all that much ourselves, right? Because we don't change that quickly. We don't become new human beings. Our genes are what were there 50,000 years ago. So when we do studies on people who lived at that time, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio was 1 is to 1. Today, a lot of oils which are bandied about as healthy oils, like sunflower oil, this are, they're all not omega-3 and they're omega-6. So we're still in, in many populations, like in India, there was a study, in, I think we have more than 12 to 1 ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. So we know for a fact that if an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is in populations, this is a population, not an individual, because genomics is like that, is increases risk of breast cancer when it's 10 to 1 or less. 5 to 1 is for diabetes. 3 to 1 is for immune system diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. So we do know those incidences go up because over time we're shaping the wrong kind of genes. Um, so if you ask me, there's not a direct gene which gives you the immunity, but what can you do to improve your immune system? I'll say make sure your omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is as close to 1 to one as you can be. Kanika? I have two related questions. One I, is I'll of, come to uh, this side in a second. I'll come back. Would you advocate uh, gene testing at a universal level, and if so, at what age group? And is, would gene typing then be a kind of corollary to, to, to that kind of testing? And a third question, um, is there something called an addictive gene? And how could we use gene testing to deal with it at a preventive level? I, I think uh, all, um, so first of all, I'll go backwards, the addictive gene, definitely. Yes, some people are more prone to addiction. So I said earlier that people, for example, who can get addicted to sugar, for example, are the same people who can also get addicted to other drugs. Um, and so we can actually pick that. Now. We also know like stress genes, the, each thing you can do, things like mindfulness, meditation, various things actually help in people coping with a lot of things so they don't turn to that when they're under stress. Um, what was the first question? The, the, uh, do you, oh, do, do you yeah. recommend? So, um, I think you see, first of all, I must clarify, when you say gene testing, there are many different types. 
So the WGS of the whole genome sequencing is what you see in the US largely, like 23 big companies. Um, they test your entire genome, mostly for illness. The concern I really have with it is in security of the data and what it's going to do for your insurance and things in the future, right? And also the fact, like the Angelina Jolie thing we discussed, there's unnecessary anxiety, and we're forgetting that stress and anxiety also lead to many conditions. So that's why I don't test for diseases. I only test for wellness. Unfortunately, because of restrictions in India in being able to ship biological samples, people can order my test online anywhere in the world except India right now and I'm hoping to be able to. If you ask me what is my vision for it, is at a primary level, if you can change people's behavior, which is what we're doing with the school children, we don't need to gene test them as long as you knew these simple rules using this knowledge, um, but the earlier you start them and the earlier the kids learn these habits, that stays with them. So we know, for example, salt as an example. Child given more salt in infancy develops a taste for much more salt. And we know that reducing one gram of salt in the UK was studied done Professor McGregor at the Wolfson Institute in London would prevent 65,000 deaths. Ancient man ate 1.5 grams of salt a day. I just looked at an instant noodle thing in one of the stores here that had 880 grams, right? So the point is you just have um, one, your half your uh, a milligram, sorry. So what I mean, half your daily uh, quarter has already gone in it. So we, on average, consume more than five grams. So things like that, you know, we know what we can do. But you have some uh, gene testing kits. Absolutely. So we can kits. test. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have think a they're available I've at the book. With me. They're, they're available at the bookstore. No, I actually got them with me. So but during there's, there's the signing, you can ask handful. him and buy them okay. from him. That, and then I'll come to this site. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask you. It's a little continuation to what she's uh, what she said. With CRISPR coming in, now that they are talking about doing CRISPR or the human, CRISPR. the gene editing on humans, how do you think it's going to affect the diseases and the medicines that are going to come up in the next few years? And also I wanted to add that with the kind of lifestyle that we are living, genetic diseases like cerebral ataxia are now becoming non-genetic and the cases of, non -genetic dis of it being non-genetic are just increasing. I think CRISPR is quite dangerous, and I think you have to, there's so many ethical issues and other things. So for people who don't know, CRISPR is the way you can just literally edit your genes like you're editing a Word uh, document. And I, get, I guess the problem, there's too many ethical things. See, my focus is really on genomics for wellness, so I'm not the best person to talk about that. But what I can say is that, like what happened in China, now somebody... Uh, using CRISPR to produce babies who are resistant to HIV. I mean, how irresponsible is that? Because what you don't know is the effects that's going to have on other genes. So these children are now going to be growing up with abnormal genes, not like the rest of us. So I think that's terribly dangerous to do it willy-nilly, and I, I really fear for our future that we're really going down the wrong path if we think we can just play God like that. So I really have got to be very careful in which kind of a situation that would be even applicable. But there's a whole ethical issue yeah, around massively. it. There's a huge ethical yeah, yeah. debate. Uh, and, I think, and, yeah. It's and even, science sometimes tends to overcome uh, or sort of outweigh the ethics because there's always somebody trying to There's always to going to be a maverick that. somewhere doing it, but the problem you've got to ask yourself is what ultimately makes us human is what got us this far. We didn't actually what got humanity this far. See, when we left Africa, our footprint was very small. There were many more creatures. Today, our footprint is very large. But there are plenty of studies which showed that what nurtured us is our ability to form colonies, how we nurtured each other, not the fact that we were individualistic. But if you take this kind of technology, then only the wealthy can edit what they want in their genes. And I don't think that's how, that's what makes us human. So I'm really a against it. Again, I'm going to do clusters here. So one, and then give it to the gentleman in the black. And then next to you, and then we'll come to the back in a second. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Paul. I'm a big fan of your work ever since I read Skin. Thank and you. my question is around uh, value systems and genetics, right? So in the Vedic tradition, there's a concept of samskara. And also in, in any dynastic family, whether it's the Carnegie's or Kennedy's, there's this concept that if you're from a particular line, you have a set of value systems, you know? And is, that, is there any study to verify that? Is it just nurture or genetics? So value systems hold that. Next. Huh? Ask away. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> my question is related to animals. Is, is, is that okay? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Uh, why only dinosaurs uh, extend, even uh, 
they are uh, repels family blo bl belong to and in the repels family crocodile is there turtle is there uh, so uh, why did dinosaurs go inst extinct okay yeah. one more question sir i am dr alok jain please uh, little elaborate biology has no bias and uh, prematurely aging so premature aging biology knows no bias why are dinosaurs extinct and does um, values play a, play a role i guess the first question is you know genes don't really care about the race is very democratic and like it goes back to what i'm saying biology really has no bias right so in some ways um what, genes are largely the other way of doing your actions your karma becomes your genes right so you eat rubbish not only you turn to rubbish but uh, 25000 years later somebody is studying your fossil and your fossil is also rubbish right um, so 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 really uh, the fact is that uh, th that's what so like uh, but but there is hope so so you can um, change it by your behavior and what was interesting in this study on mice and i actually wrote that article in the us but it didn't get published because it was titled trumping your hot head but they didn't realize it was a verb so they said you wasn't allowed unless i changed the title you <laughs> so anyway it's just by the by but that was literally what i was saying is you can trump your hot head um, by actually eating more sensibly and then you wouldn't be tweeting furiously at midnight um but uh, the second question was on animals i'm not an expert on dinosaurs so i'm guessing that small brain relative to large size we know that in creatures in my studies calorie restrictions and the smaller size you are the better your chances of survival so so i think smaller brain combined with larger bulk you probably chances of survival were lower than if you're a little creature that's why cockroaches outlived everyone else right because i think we always say a little mouse lives longer than the big fat mouse and right and, and the then, third question is like i said biology has no bias so what i mean is that humans we have bigotry so we put our biases on biology or genomics or skin color or things like that so people went to europe i would expect that their skin lightened because there was no sun for half the year if those people were eating a lot of vitamin d like the inuit you know that their skin color wouldn't darken so they'd still be a bit darker and be okay so everything around the world like populations athletic ability various things how humanity has panned out what we think are differences between us as actually not we're all one human race we are one humanity there's really no difference between us so i've often said this that we think because we look different we're different skin color if we supplemented babies in india provided they didn't have any metabolic problem you check that 50000 international units vitamin d months so on so forth i i would have been few inches taller you we would have been more athletic so there are things like that we know for a fact but the fact is but when we see all these differences and differences in ability we assume that fundamentally we are different which we are not so that's what i mean by that uh the last two questions one here and one there and one in front we we'll, again in clusters because we have five Hello, minutes sir, left uh, i must say amazing amazing talk this is by far the best session i've attended in jail because i've got to learn so much question uh so i have Sanjay, read a lot let, about let him finish that praise yeah, we know you is amazing <laughs> <laughs> you know okay. gene of so, being big head yeah, yeah. i looking forward to read your books are a huge fan of dawkins myself evolutionary bio biology i've been reading a lot about it recently i am stuck in the question of ethics and science altogether so the whole notion of human rights the whole notion of rights to a particular species called homo sapiens and not to other primates or, or you know the the uh, species who are closer to us in the evolutionary cycle uh, disturbed me a lot so i am progressing towards turning vegan uh, that's because i don't have any logic question, to you know question, question. Uh, eat the uh, the the other species now uh, the question is regarding the the uh, pain and suffering that species feel so how do i explain to my friends when they say if you like even bertrand russell at one point of time said question. that if you please please allow me 20 no, seconds please no no because okay, i've got all right Come so on. uh is there a continuum in the species uh, feeling pain uh, the sentient beings feeling like oysters do they feel the same amount of pain as homo human beings and can plants really feel pain please please okay. answer that okay so hold that can all of these people feel pain question in the front and we'll come to the back including oysters which i love don't say oysters feel pain no. so my Bad question karma. is very quick in the corporate world there is this whole thing about standing and working so does standing qualify as movement 
the standing qualifies movement last question uh, supposedly once we have done gene mapping so where is the oh uh, supposedly we have done gene ma mapping and we have some uh, propensity for a disease we eat a better food live a better lifestyle is that is that more the solution helpful? is that more helpful or we do uh, meditation and spirituality that is okay um so i guess the no, what was the what was the short question again oh, yeah. standing uh, yeah i i think you see well, the reason that came about is when you stand your heart beats um uh, 10 beats faster then when you are lying down and what they thought is that therefore you are getting some exercise without getting exercise but just more recently it was debunked just very recently they found after selling millions of these standing Stand desks tables. that they don't really it's not definitely as good as walking because your leg movement is the important part so perhaps if you had a treadmill under it and you were standing and you <laughs> kept moving your legs perhaps it would be useful um answer your question with diet and exercise uh, with your diet yes there are lots of things you can improve um but and meditation and mindfulness is very good for reducing stress and that helps those genes as well and we know that stress also worsens illness so people are more stressed so they're all linked up you can't compartmentalize them um, and pain and oysters and, and trees i must say he's asking the question about um pain in animals i i mean animals feel pain but i i'm not expert in plants so i can't answer that but one thing i'll tell you speaking on genes is when human genome was mapped we assumed the first gene uh, first big mapping was on the c elegans worm right so when they mapped the worm the, these worms we study for longevity because they're virtually transparent so you can see them and they they had 19000 genes right ballpark so everybody thought we'll have billions because they're so much better you know what's scary we had 26000 but those 19000 were the same genes so if somebody came here and you moved away from them that's the same gene the worm does when you put a finger in it, it avoids you right so 70% were all worms now but here's what's interesting is when i then looked at a cabbage because i know nothing about plants and i thought let's look at the genes of a cabbage a cabbage has 45000 genes and we've got only 26000 right the reason for that is because these cabbages but we've got many of them in common with a cabbage so if you're eating uh, so i'm not so sure then if if your argument extends then you uh, is it ethical to eat somebody has more genes than you do no i'm not kidding i'm not, i'm not, I'm, not, I'm joking Seriously. but but yeah yeah but more seriously the reason is that because they're underground uh, they pick up all these viruses and various microbes and they get all their genomes stuck in them but they don't have the mechanisms to get rid of them as we do that's why we have fewer genes than a cabbage wow on that very happy <laughs> genetic note thank you all very much yes, dr sharad paul yes, he's going to be signing after this so please go and get your book signed you can also order up your genetic kits as i'm here for the last time at samvad this year i'd like to take an occasion to thank uh, sujata subramaniam your venue manager laura wherever she is a wonderful technical team our camera people our security and our amazing volunteers let's hear it for them thank you all so much thank you all for coming see you all next year or see you later at the debate thank you so